Hey guys, it's your boy Chili here. Welcome back to Hardware 3D. This is I'm gonna I'm gonna say this is uh, episode 20. Yeah, that sounds about right. And I think 20 episodes deep into this series called Hardware 3D, maybe we should actually render something in 3D. What do you say? So, looking at our code here, we got our draw test triangle, which is not drawing a triangle, but many triangles. Um, we want to draw a cube. We want to do that. So what are we going to need to change? Obviously, we're going to need to change our geometry here, our vertices and our indices. And we're also going to need to change the definition of our geometry because if we're going to draw a cube in three dimensions, we probably need a Z component to our vertices. And uh, the last thing we're going to need is we're going to need to add a uh, projection transform into our st stack of transforms here. So let's, uh, let's do that stuff. It's not going to be that difficult at all. Step one. Done. We got our Z component. Step two. We're going to replace those two-dimensional vertices with three-dimensional vertices. We've got eight of them here. And if you know anything about a cube, it's got eight vertices. Just count them. Uh, this cube is going to range in the X, Y, and Z axes from negative one to positive one. You can see that easily by inspection here. If this geometry here is baffling to you, then I really recommend that you go look at my 3D Fundamentals series because I cover cubes a lot in that series, do a lot of stuff with cubes. So there is the vertices. Now we have to index into those vertices, to create all the triangles of the cube. Cube has six faces, two triangles per face. That's 12 triangles. That's gonna look something like this. Uh, it's not too terribly difficult to do by hand. It's just quite annoying, especially since you've got to take into account winding direction. And again, if you want the dirty, gory details of all this stuff, look at 3D Fundamentals. I'm not going to waste everyone's time and talk about it again here. So, we've got our vertices, we've got our indices, now we need our transformation, our projection. And uh, if you have watched 3D Fundamentals, you might be expecting some gory bu bullshit here, but no, because DirectX Math has our back. And they've gotten some nice functions in here. We got matrix perspective left hand. And that's going to do it all for us. Very nice and simple. All we got to do is provide the size of our view, um, our projection surface, basically. So that's going to be, well, the width, we'll set that to one. And the height, we got to set that to three over four, because that matches the aspect ratio of our window, right? Uh, and then the last thing it's asking for is the near Z and the far Z. So we want to clip things that are closer than, let's say, 0 0.5 and further than 10. Uh, those numbers should be fine. And if we run this, we get nothing. Good day, sir. Well, um, I mean, our cube is at where, wherever it's at. I forget. But it's definitely the, the close face is going to be closer than 0 0.5. And so we want to we want to back off. We want to step back there a little bit. Just back off. All right, now we've stepped back and we can see our cube here and it's looking like it's a little distorted in the Y direction. Uh, I can't see the side of it yet, so I don't know if my projection is working correctly or not, but we can solve some of these problems, I believe. So the problem with the distortion is quite uh, plain. We were adding this scaling in here to adjust for the aspect ratio, but now the aspect ratio is already being adjusted for with our perspective matrix. So we don't need this garbage in here anymore. Get that out of here. Get that trash out of here. Uh, but what we do want is we want a little more rotation so we can see the other sides of our cube to inspect whether it is good or not. So we'll add another rotation around Z in there with the same angle uh, variable. And let's see here. Do we get, oh, we don't have a cube. That is. That's definitely not a cube. What's the problem? Well, I mean, it's not quite that simple, right? You can't just add a Z into here in your structure and hope that everything is going to work out. You've got to tell the direct 3D side that you have added a Z. So, how do you do that? Well, you go down into... Where is it? Uh, here, maybe. And we're going to have to change the position element of our input here. So... This thing here, let's just Google DXGI format. Let's find the page that has all the formats. Here it is right here. And we can see DXGI format RGB 32, 32, 32 float. That's the one that we want. 
Now, since we're doing that, another thing you have to change is this offset here. We could just have Direct3D do the offset for us automatically, and that would probably be a better idea, but I don't remember the name of the symbol from making it automatic, so I'm just going to put a 12 in there. That's fine, too. Now, if we run this, hopefully, hopefully, we're going to get... No, it's still... It looks better. We've got our colors, but it's still not good. What's wrong? Well... Our shader is probably still expecting a two-dimensional input, and we're giving it a three-dimensional input. That's not very good, is it? So, where? Give me a three-dimensional input for the position, and then we're going to take the position.x, the position.y. We don't need to do that, do we? We could just do float4 constructed from float3 plus a 1 for the, uh, the w component. And that syntax also works fine. And now we're inputting three-dimensional. And we have a Mahler truck and cube. Look at this. Oh my god, it's three-dimensional. It's beautiful. It's colorful. So we have rendered our 3D cube. And that concludes this video series. You now have mastered the art of 3D rendering in direct 3D. Or man, maybe we could we could do a little more, can we? All right, now let's have some fun with shader bullshit. We are going to give each of the faces of this cube a solid color instead of interpolating color from the vertices. Now it seemed like solid color would be a simpler effect, but actually it's more complicated. Um, and you should know this from 3D fundamentals. There are two ways we can achieve it. We can make each face be an in independent, so it'll have independent vertices. Uh, so that means we'd have to increase our number of vertices to 24. Uh, but we don't want to do that. We want to have the minimum number of vertices. So the other thing we can do, and we did this in 3D fundamentals, is we can give each triangle its own unique ID, its index starting from zero. And then we can use that index to do a lookup into an array of colors. And that's what we're gonna do here. Now in 3D Fundamentals, we gave the index in the geometry shader. But in uh, HLSL, in Direct3D, you can feed that index into pixel shader directly as well. You don't need to create a geometry shader for that. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a constant buffer that is going to be bound to the pixel shader and that is going to hold the array of colors to do the lookup. It's going to look something like this. It's just an array of a struct and that struct contains the color channels. Now this stuff has to be aligned properly so it's best that we also include the A value here instead of just RGB. But uh, yeah, it's all going to work out. And notice that we're storing in float instead of int because the amount of data is small and we don't want the shader to have to do conversions all the time, the pixel shader. Then we create the constant buffer here, and again, like I said, it's six values because there are six faces on the cube. So this color is going to be used for the first two triangles, the next two, etc, etc. And then we actually create the constant buffer. It's the same process as for the other constant buffer for the vertex shader. Nothing really changes here, we're just using different data and a different layout. And then finally we bind that constant buffer to the pixel shader. And there you go. Now, we're going to have to look into the pixel shader, and we are going to have to add some stuff in here. So in the pixel shader, we'll declare a constant buffer that has an array of float 4s, and those are the face colors. And you can declare an array just like this, it just looks the same as in C, so it shouldn't be that difficult for you to understand. Now, we're not going to be inputting a color, because our vertices aren't going to have a color anymore. So what do we input? We're going to input an unsigned int, we'll call it the TID for the triangle ID, and the type of that is system value, it's a special value, primitive ID. And this will tell the, uh, the pipeline to generate a primitive ID for every triangle, a unique ID, and that will be passed into the pixel shader. So the pixel shader will know which triangle it's working with, and it will use that information to look up into this table. And that lookup is going to look something like this, it's triangle ID divided by 2 because there are two triangles for every face on the cube. Now the vertex shader is no longer going to be taking in col color, and it also it is no longer going to be outputting color, so we can actually get rid of this structure altogether. We can just return a uh, float 4 for the position, we're just going to mark it as such here, and then because there's nothing to do with color here, we don't need this, we don't need this, can just return this result directly. So now we got all the stuff done for the new effect, but we got to do a little bit of cleanup here, right? Because things have changed. We're no longer going to be passing in color per vertex, so we can delete that. And we can also delete the uh, now the color part 
of these vertices here because it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, this doesn't make any sense, so we'll delete that from there. And now we've got to change the layout of our input data if we can freaking find here it is. So now we only have one element in the input and that is the position. So we get rid of that other guy. And uh, if I have not missed anything, that should be it. But the chances that I miss something are not small. Shader compiler is telling me that uh, this primitive ID semantic is not supported on whatever level this is being compiled at. So let's take a look at the properties here. HLSL compiler, general, pixel shader, 4, level 9, 3. Let's just go pixel shader level 4. Not do compatibility with direct x9. Now it was set to debug. We want to set it to all configurations. And we'll go back here and we'll do this again. Why are you trying to screw me over? Here we go. Now that bad boy works. Well, it compiles. Whether it works, uh, it does indeed seem to work. So, now we've got our solid cube. What is next? Well, let's try to render two cubes now. What could be better than one cube? Two cubes. So in app do frame, we're going to do a little bit of hanky panky. We're going to add another call to draw test triangle here, but it is going to draw at zero and zero. Whereas this one's going to draw at the, you know, the most X and the most Y, you know, with a bunch of scaling and stuff thrown in there for fun. So the question now is what other hanky panky is Chili going to do? Well, I'm going to do one more thing here and it's going to be fun. You're going to like it. Instead of those values being X and Y, we're going to make it X and Z. Uh, because I want to be able to control the Z position of my boy. So we're going to go here is zero and here is Z plus four. So now when we move up and down our mouse up and down on the screen, the Z should be going farther away and closer. And this is going to reveal something to us that must be addressed. So here's our two cubes. And we bring our cube closer, and it looks like it's getting closer. Now, if we, what if we bring it farther out? What do you notice here? This cube now, the, uh, the small cube should be farther away than the big cube, because they're both the same size, right? Except that the big cube is being obscured by the thing that is behind it. That's probably not a good thing, right? And you guys already know the issue here, right? It's the draw order. We're drawing the, the cube that is behind, the stationary cube. We're drawing it first. So the second cube is being drawn over top of it, regardless of their relative positions in the Z axis. So what we need to do is we need to do Z buffering. I've covered this in great detail in 3D Fundamentals, but we need to know how to implement that stuff in Direct 3D. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the constructor for graphics, and we are going to create and bind the Z buffer. The Z buffer doesn't need to be touched, really, once it's been set up. It can just remain there from frame to frame, uh, but we got to set it up once and the best place to do that is going to be in our constructor. As you already know, a depth buffer is something, it's like a surface. It's kind of like a frame buffer, whereas a frame buffer stores colors, a depth buffer stores depth values. Now, when we create device and swap chain, those frame buffers, they get created automatically. But for the depth buffer, we're going to have to create the texture ourselves, get a view on that texture and then bind it to the output merger. So number one, we're going to create and bind the state. And then number two, we're going to create and bind the texture. Now the descriptor for creating the depth state is called D3D11 depth stencil descriptor. And this brings us to something that I have to touch upon, but we're not going to go into deep detail. In, and that is the idea of a stencil buffer. Uh, because in direct 3D and in hardware in general, the depth buffer shares space with something else called a stencil buffer. They're both kinds of masks, um, but the depth masks only works specifically on depth. It's optimized for depth and it only works with depth. Whereas a stencil, you can do a whole bunch of different operations with it having to do with masking. Uh, things like mirrors, things like portals, they're generally done with a stencil buffer. We're not going to use a stencil buffer right now. That's for special effects. We'll deal with that when we cross that bridge. But I just wanted you to be aware of why this word is chilling out in the middle of our descriptor name. So if we take a look at our structure here, we can see it's got a bunch of members, um, stencil stuff we can ignore. We can just set that to zero and it'll be the default, which is basically just disabled. So depth enable. 
Obviously, we probably want to do that one, right? I don't think I need to explain that in too much detail. Now, all these other guys, we could probably use a little reference for them. Here's the docs. First one, enable depth testing. Yes, we want to do that. Second one, depth right mask. What is that? Well, there's two options. Mask zero, mask all, turn on, turn on. Obviously, we want to turn on. D3D11 comparison function allows us to determine what kind of comparison is done to select the behavior of the mask, whether the pixel should be, the color should be written or discarded. And we want to, we want to use less, right? So if the Z value is less, then that means it's closer to the screen and it should be, the pixel should be chosen and it should overwrite what was there before. Stencil enable, all this stuff we don't care about. Well, these last two guys here, front face and back face, the documentation here is a little deceptive. Uh, they allow us to specify how the results of the stencil test are used for the case of when the triangle is facing front and the case of when the triangle is facing backwards. Um, here it says how they use results for depth test and stencil test. But if you look in here, it's all stencil stuff. So it doesn't actually matter for the depth testing. You can just leave it default because we're disabling stencil testing. It's just it's Microsoft, you know, try, trying to keep you on your toes. That's what it is. So to finish up, all we've got to put into our structure here is right mask, which is all, and the depth function, which is less. And then we just need a pointer and we got to fill that pointer. And that happens much like you would expect. You pass it a uh, pointer to the structure, the descriptor, and you pass it a pointer. You pass it to PP, it fills your PP. It makes your PP full. And then let's bind that to the pipeline. Uh, depth stuff gets bound to the output merger because that's where it happens, right? That's where the pixels are getting merged onto the frame buffer. This value here, the second value, uh, stencil ref, that is really only used for uh, stenciling operations. So it doesn't, I don't think it really matters which value you put in here. I put in a one. You could experiment with different values, see if it messes stuff up. I don't think it will. So now we've created the state and we've bound the state. Now we have to create the texture. So we get a pointer, we get a descriptor. We set the width and the height for this texture that we're creating. These next two here, MIP levels and array size, um, this has to do with MIP mapping. And that is a concept that we will be covering in a couple of videos when I talk about texturing. But for right now, all you need to know is that you don't want multiple MIP levels, you just set this to one. And you can also, when you're creating a 2D texture, you can create a, an array of textures in a single direct 3D texture resource. But that doesn't make much sense for what we're doing here. We only want a single texture for the depth buffer. So we set that to one. Now, the next one is very important. We got to set the format of each element in this texture. Uh, and we want to set that to D32 flow. This is a special one here. Normally it's RGBA32. D32 is a special one for depth. So we want to set it to D32 float. And then we'll get 32 bit floating point values for each of our depth values. And that's the same as what we did in 3D Fundamentals. There are other options. You could do 16 bit um, normalized integer values. Um, and there's also options for when you're doing stencil buffering, you have to split your data between the stencil buffer and the depth buffer. But for right now, we're only doing depth. So D32 float is going to give us what we want. Now the texture 2D descriptor contains a sample descriptor structure. And that is for basically that is for anti aliasing processing. Um, you can get the count and the number of samples and the quality value. And since we're not using anti aliasing right now, this should be set to one and zero. Again, anti aliasing, something that we'll look at in the future. But for right now, forget about it. And the last two parameters here, the usage and the bind flag. So like normal, we just use the default usage, but the bind flag, very important that you set that to bind depth stencil because that's what we're going to be using this resource for. And then you call a function on the device, create texture 2D, just pass it the descriptor, you pass it uh, sub resource data that would be used to fill the texture and then you pass it your PP. And of course, we're not filling the texture with anything because it is going to be generated every frame as depth information, so that's null. But there you go, and now your PP is full. Now, in order to bind textures to the pipeline, you need to get a view on the texture, just like we did with our, uh, what was it, our back buffer. We need to get a view on that in order 
to clear the back buffer, we also need to get a view on our depth texture in order to bind that to the pipeline. But we need that view for another reason. So we should actually maintain the reference to that. So we're going to create it in here. So that's a COM pointer, ID 3D11 depth stencil view, PDSV. And the process here is not super complicated. There's not much to go into this descriptor here. Uh, the format should match this one, or you can put it as unknown and it will just take this format. The dimensions should be a 2D texture. And we're not using any weird MIP stuff for this, so this should be set to zero. And there you go. Pass it a pointer to your texture interface. Pass it a pointer to your descriptor. You pass it your PP, and now your PP is full and you've got your depth stencil view. And then finally we bind our depth stencil view to the pipeline. And this is bound with the same function that binds the render target. They're both bound at the same time. So we just, this was before, this was no pointer. And now we're going to bind depth stencil. Now because we're binding it here once, we should definitely not be binding it here again because we'll be unbinding our uh, depth stencil view. So get rid of that. That is no longer necessary. And that should be it, my friends. We now have Z buffering all done for us. And if we run this, we get absolutely nothing. All right. So there's one more thing that we need to do. And that is whenever we clear the screen for a new frame, we've also got to clear that depth buffer. We do that in here. And this is also the reason why I'm maintaining that pointer to the depth stencil view, because we need it every frame to call clear buffer. And that process is very straightforward. All we got to do is call a clear depth stencil view on the depth stencil view. D3D11 clear depth. The maximum depth of our system is going to be one. So this is the value to set to. And the stencil, we're setting it to zero, although it obviously doesn't matter because we're not using stenciling. And if we run that, now we get our cubes. And lo and behold, they are properly interpenetrating here and they are occluding each other with the correct depth that we know and love. And there you have it, my friends. We have achieved 3D rendering with depth buffering. In the next video, we're gonna change gears a little bit and we're gonna improve the organization and the architecture of our code because right now we just got a whole bunch of bullshit chilling out in the draw test triangle function, which isn't even drawing triangles anymore, it's drawing cubes, but whatever. We're going to put on our software engineering hat and we're going to make some sexy bullshit happen. Well, until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more hardware 3D.